Revelation 8, verses 1 to 13. A brief word of prayer before we go into meditating, meditation of the Word of God. Father, we pray that we, each one of us, Lord, we bring our thoughts captive to Christ Jesus, so that, Lord, as you speak to us, it may not be human wisdom or human understanding, but your Word, Father, that comes to each one of us, starting with me standing at the pulpit and each and every one of us, Father, that we will receive your Word, our hearts, will be prepared grounds, good soil, so that that seed that we receive bears fruit in our lives. Father, and help us to not only be listeners of the word, but also to be doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to meditate from Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 13, the whole chapter. But before we go into the, those verses, I want to give you a little bit of recap and review about what we meditated on last week. Uh, in chapter 7, there were two major things that we saw over there. We saw the 144,000, which is a representation of church on the earth, which is protected and sealed by God. And then we saw the church triumphant and rejoicing in heaven. Now, there is a theology called replacement theology. I don't believe in that theology. Uh, but what I do know from my studies and from what I can gather from the scripture is that the Old Testament Israel was the model of the church. You see, let me give you the big picture. God created man, mankind. And how did he create mankind? He created them in his image. Now, those who were created in the image of God when they decided to disobey God, sin came in. So basically what is sin? Sin is rebelling against God, is rejecting God and His, His instructions and commands in our lives. And uh, so from that moment of the fall of mankind, God, the loving Heavenly Father, He wants to redeem those whom He has created in His image. And he has thrown open the invitation and he starts by picking up a group of people. What was the role of Israel? You know, many times we raise a particular group of people. We, we, we love segregation, don't we? This is how, how we have been trained from childhood. We segregate in color. We segregate in, you know, we give a special treatment to rich and, and another one to the poor. You know, we, we, we are all biased. This is the way the world has taught us to be. We look at, we judge people by races, we judge people by their looks, by what they wear and what, you know, we judge people by appearances. God, who is a loving Heavenly Father, He doesn't look at any of these, He doesn't have favoritism. What does He see? He sees mankind that is created in His image, who had a destiny of fellowship and walk with God, having fallen, and He hates that fallenness. He hates to see us in that state of fallenness. So that God, that loving Heavenly Father, from the date when, when mankind decided to rebel against God, He already had the plan how to restore mankind through His Son, Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, He takes this group of people called Israel. You know, we also tend to put Israel on a pedestal, which, we sh which is an injustice that we would do to Israel if we put them on a pedestal. I will share with some verses here. What was the role of Israel? The role of Israel is God took them as a representation, as a model. He worked with them in order to showcase to the entire world that I want to relate with you like this. I want you to be in a relationship dedicated to me like this. So when you come into the New Testament, what happens? What did Jesus Commission. Now, you know, even in the Old Testament, you see the picture of the grafting in into the vine. You have somebody like Ruth. I'm just giving you one example there. Ruth, who was not an Israelite, who was grafted in, and she now is an ancestor to King David, an ancestor to Jesus, and God picked up somebody from the nations and brought and grafted her in. Elijah. Elijah is is identified as Elijah the Tishbite, which means people who came and settled in. Tishbe are people who came and settled, the settlers. 
And so when you come to the New Testament, you find what is the commission that Jesus give. He says, go into the ends of the earth and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I've taught, taught, taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, go and wait in Jerusalem because you are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, I want you. What is, why, why do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's not for us to have goosebumps and feel good and you know, say that I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. No. The reason that we get baptized in the Holy Spirit is so that we can be witnesses of Christ. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I can see from Jerusalem, God, what is God saying? His arms are open wide and saying, from here we will radiate the gospel and call out to the entire humankind because they are created in my image and I want them to come back and I have made a way for them to come back and that is Jesus on the cross had praised, has paid the price for us to come back to Christ. Those of us who are created in God's image, He wants to restore us back into fellowship with Him. I want to give you two verses before we go into Revelation chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Please turn with me. Those verses are put on the screen so that you can turn ahead in your Bibles to, to, to those portions. It is important for you to turn in your Bibles and to read to make sure that it is printed in your Bible there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. So you can see how God's plan has brought the entire world together, not just one group of people. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now, that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that, that promise that was made to Abraham was not confined to one nation. It goes beyond the boundaries of nations, races, tribes. It is for each and every one of us. So in Revelation, as I told you, the whole book of Revelation is written in imagery, and, and it is written from a prison. It is coded in a way that the recipients will understand and those who are interceptors will not understand. And so it is very clear that though the tribes of Israel are mentioned there, this is talking about the church that is coming under the protection of God before the, the time of tribulation comes. And you see that church rejoicing in heaven in, in, in the future. After the period of tribulation, you find that this church is standing victorious and rejoicing in heaven. Let's read together Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes, and lightning, and an earthquake. Silence. We see a half an hour silence. It's not literal half an hour, but it's a period of time of silence. And what you need to understand is that the scenario is like that of a court. The, the arguments and the case has been, has been presented. And now you're waiting for the verdict of the judge. And so the whole courtroom is silence in suspense of the serious case. And what is the judge going to say? What is the jury and judge discussing? And what is the verdict going to be? So this is the scenario. 
the world is anticipating God moving in judgment and so everybody is in awe and in suspense of what is going to happen. In Zechariah chapter 2 verse 13, Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. See, God is an awesome, fearful God. He is an awe-inspiring God. You know, so when He is about to predict, uh, to give His verdict, the whole earth is in suspense. What is God going to say? What is He going to say about me? What is He, how is He going to handle me in this situation? Seven angels may indicate a specific group of angels that are in, entrusted with a specific task of, of bringing forth the warning through the trumpets. They are given a trumpet each, and, and the trumpet is meant to give warnings. They are standing in the presence of God, which indicates that they are ready for service. They are ready to carry out the instruction that God is going to give them. The trumpet has various symbolisms attached with it in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the trumpet was used. Uh, Moses made two silver trumpets. It was used to uh, assemble the people together. And then it was used to move people to announce to them it is time to break camp and to move on. And so they would order themselves by tribes and they would move as a column of tribes. It was used to announce war. It was used to announce uh, warning to people that pe you are being attacked, sword is coming. And uh, it, was, it was used to announce that let us go to war. And it was used when kings were being coronated. In the New Testament, and especially in this context here, in the book of uh, Revelation, it is being used to announce the coming wrath of God upon a disobedient and rebellious world, uh, upon people who will continue to harden their hearts and resist and rebel against God. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter, the mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. So these trumpets, as I told you in the last few weeks, God is escalating these, these plagues, these calamities on earth. God is the one who is allowing it to happen. Why? Because for thousands of years, God has opened His arm wide to, uh, to His people who were created in His image and telling them, come to the saving knowledge. I have, I have made the way out for you. You cannot pay for your sins. You cannot do anything that will save you. The only thing that can save you is the precious blood of my son, Jesus Christ, that was shed on the cross of Calvary. I have made the way for you. So for thousands of years, that open invitation is open to each and every one of us. And now God is saying that period is coming to a close. Church, take warning. That period of grace is coming to a close and these are signs, these are warnings that are coming out to us, to us as a church and to the world out there who walks in rebellion that you need to come to the saving knowledge. There is only one way. There is no other ways. Religion is not going to save man. What is religion? Religion is man's search for God. But it is only in Christ you find God coming searching for man. Every other religion, man feels the vacuum in his, in his her, or her heart and they go searching for God. They're like those, the story of the blind people, the four or five blind people. They heard about the elephant. They don't know what an elephant is like. So one day somebody told them, here is an elephant. So everybody went and felt one person held the, the foot of the elephant and said, wow, an elephant is like a column. The other one went and held the tail of the elephant and said, wow, the elephant is like a whip. The other one went and held the trunk of the elephant and said, elephant is like a snake. The other one held the tusk and said, wow, the elephant is like a sword. The other guy was dropping around the stomach of the elephant and said, the elephant is like a wall. None of them had the right idea about the elephant. Therefore, religion is not going to save you. All religions are good. They, they teach good things, but religion is not going to save you because it is only man's effort to find a God. It is only that infinite God 
who can reveal himself to a finite being like us. And God, that is why God had to come as a human being, as Jesus, to identify to, so that you and I could understand the love and heart of God. So it is only through Christ that there is salvation. There is no other salvation anywhere else. There is no salvation in our good works. There is no salvation in whatever we do. But only when we humble ourselves and are obedient to God and receive with humility that plan of His through His Son Jesus, that is the only way we come to salvation. Another angel we see, he's performing some priestly functions. And uh, we find him with the censer. And in the censer, there is censer is an object in which you put hot coal and then you put frankincense so that you know a fragrant smoke comes up and, and it just represents the prayers. What does this, this represent? It represents our prayers. So do not be discouraged with your prayer. You need to have a lifestyle of prayer. Do not think that, oh, my prayer, I don't know how to pray. Don't worry about that. You just be committed. You just speak to God. You just listen to God. It is a two-way communication, not just a one-way shopping list that we give to God. But we speak to God. God speaks to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27. This gives me a lot of comfort and encouragement. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now I want you to have this picture. You and I, in our weak prayer, in the weaknesses of how we pray and the weaknesses of our life, but when we pray, what happens is that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us. The Holy Spirit takes our weak prayers and converts them into powerful prayers. And in heaven, in the throne room of heaven, what happens is that this beautiful fragrant smoke spreads the entire room. Our prayers are converted into powerful, beautiful, acceptable prayers in the sight of God. So I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, be people of prayer. Spend time in the presence of God in prayer. Have dedicated time to pray. And as the Bible teaches us, pray without ceasing. In all aspects of your life, acknowledge God. Turn to God. Ask Him. Consult Him. You know, we, we need to be people who are walking daily in that communion, in that communication with God. Amen? Then in uh, the intensity of the plague keeps increasing in each series. It goes from the seal to the trumpet to the bow till the wrath of God is unleashed on a world of people who are, who are still hardening their hearts against Him. Now what is the purpose of the trumpet? I want you to please go home, write this down, Ezekiel chapter 3, 33. Read the whole chapter. A watchman is put on the wall with a trumpet in his hand and he's given the responsibility that when you see your, the enemies coming, blow the trumpet and warn the people so that they will prepare themselves. And in Ezekiel 33 it says that if, you, if the watchman doesn't blow the trumpet when he's supposed to blow it, and as a result, if people die by the sword, then their blood will be on the watchman. But if the watchman blows the trumpet and the people do not take heed, then they will die by the sword, but their blood will be upon themselves. Who is that watchman today? You and I as a church are that watchman. We've been given the trumpet of the gospel. We've been commissioned by Jesus, go into all the earth and preach the gospel to make disciples. And so we cannot afford to be quiet. Woe unto us if we keep quiet and don't preach the gospel. See, God expects you, why has He put you in a place of work? Not for you to earn a living, that's the secondary reason. The primary reason is for you to preach the gospel then. God has put you in a family, why? Because He wants you to preach the gospel there. He wants you to have a witness for Him over there. He has put you in a school that you are His ambassador in that school so that you preach the gospel there. How can you and I afford to keep quiet? when God has entrusted us this heavy responsibility, if we don't blow the trumpet and warn, then destruction will come on the people who are supposed to receive the warning, but their blood will be accounted to us. I pray that none of us will be responsible. We'll have, none of us should have blood on our hand. 
of other people. Our job is to warn them about the, about the open invitation from God to turn from wickedness to righteousness, from darkness to light, and to save yourself from the wrath that is coming, the wrath of God. We see a lot of parallels between these plagues that we are going to talk about. As each trumpet is blown, there is a plague that is unleashed, and you will find parallels to this in the plagues of Exodus where in, in uh, Egypt. The first trumpet is blown, and there is hail mixed with blood, and there is burning. And this is in parallel with the Egyptian plague in Exodus chapter 9, verse 13 to 30, 35. I want you to please read this on your own. Write this down. In Joel chapter 2, verse 31, it talks about blood and fire. And the number one-third is not literal. It is, it is talking about something that is done partial. That not the whole earth comes under this, this outpouring of the calamity, but a part of, of the land is, land is burned, part of the trees, part of the, the grass is burned. So it is not a direct attack on human beings, but it is, an, it is a plague on the nature which will indirectly affect human beings. Imagine when crops are destroyed, there is shortage of food. When uh, grass is destroyed, uh, you know, grass-eating animals have nothing to feed on. So there will be a lot of indirect effect. Why is this happening? It is again the voice of a loving father who is saying, my children, the time is coming close. The period of grace is ending. These are warning signs. These are, he's escalating it just to warn us so that we will turn away from sin and turn to God and submit ourselves to him. Second trumpet, there is something like a burning mountain thrown into the sea. Again, a portion of the sea is destroyed. Marine life is portion of marine life, portion of marine activities, portion of the sea is destroyed. And these are all warnings telling us God is going to unleash His judgment on the earth. So turn, repent. I don't know what exactly it is, that it, what is that mountain that is thrown, whether it is volcanic activities or whether it is some meteorite from outer space that comes and lands in the sea. I do not know. There is a parallel here between uh, this, this uh, plague and, and the plague in Egypt of Exodus chapter 7, verse 20 to 21. Then the third trumpet is blown and a burning star falls on the inland water. So looks like some meteorite or some comet is coming and crashing into the earth on the fresh waters and the fresh waters, a third of fresh waters up, there is destruction happening to part of the fresh waters. And uh, this is again has a parallel in Exodus chapter 7, verse 20 to 21. And the, the name of this, this object is wormwood. Wormwood symbolizes bitterness. There is a reverse miracle of this in in the book of Exodus chapter 15, where, where the Israelites have come to a place, there is no water, there is this water in Mara, which is so bitter. So God tells, instructs Moses and says, you cut this portion of the tree and throw it into the water, and this water, which is bitter, will become sweet. But now in the book of Revelation, we see the reverse of that happening. Why? Because it is warning from God that the end is near. Set your lives right before God. The mention of fire in the three trumpet plagues also corresponds to the, the priestly activity that the angel is doing. He took the incense, the burning coal, and he throws it out onto the earth, and there was uh, peals of thunder, there was earthquake. And so what I want you to take attention over here is that your prayer and my prayer has a lot of effect. You see, it is those prayers of the saints that were being offered as incense as it is poured on onto the earth. It is quickening up that coming wrath of God. Our prayers are preparing this earth. Our prayers are, are, are standing in the gap and pleading, Lord, please let the hearts of people who are hardening their hearts be turned to you. And that's your role and my role, to stand in the gap and to pray for a world that is walking in sin. And if we don't do that, that means we are not blowing the trumpet that has been given to us. We need to be people of prayer, of intercession, people who preach the word of God. Let's continue to now meditate in, 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 in uh, the portion which is verses 6 to 12, which we did not read. I'm just meditating from that. I want you to read that portion very carefully. 
and on all of these plagues. And uh, the fourth trumpet is born, blown, and the sun, moon, and stars are struck. This is a parallel to the ninth Egyptian plague in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 to 23. Darkness symbolizes, in the Old Testament, darkness symbolizes judgment. Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. The day of the Lord is going to be a day that can never be compared with any other day. It is, a, it is a spectacular event that we have never seen anything like that on earth till now. So it's a day that will inspire tremendous awe and fear in the hearts of each and every person. The whole creation will tremble and shake in His presence. In the New Testament, darkness is a symbol of demonic activities. Colossians 1.13, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. There is a lot of demonic activities going on on, on on the earth. You see, when a couple of days back you had this young 19-year-old man who went on a shooting spree and killed people in his school. How can a 19-year-old young man ruthlessly, in cold blood, decide to go on a killing rampage and kill people at random? This is nothing but demonic influence. So that means this young man has exposed his soul and heart to demonic realm, and it is only through demonic oppression that a person can do such a thing. How can an adult take a young child, a, a little ch innocent child, and violate and brutalize that child sexually? How can that happen unless that person is in, under the influence of a demonic force? It is not something that a sound-minded person can do. How can a sadist inflict pain on people and enjoy seeing people struggle in that pain? This is demonic activities. And these kind of activities happen when we expose ourselves to demonic activities. When you spend time on the screen watching pornography, you're exposing yourself to demonic activities. When you rebel and, and rebel against God and disobey God, you are exposing yourself to demonic activities. When you are unfaithful to your spouse and go and have a relationship with another person, you are exposing yourself to demonic activities and you are allowing demons to come and attack your marriage. Do you know why marriages are falling apart? It's because of these things. The, the, the manifestation may be happening here, but you have to go back in history to see where that seed of disobedience and, and rebellion was sown, where you exposed yourself and said, nobody else will see. Only I will know about it. There is a God in heaven who sees everything. And nothing will go unseen. And nothing will go unaccounted. So take heed of warning. Set your life right before God. Demonic activities will keep increasing on earth. And the next chapter you, re you will read that the plagues are going from, from this stage to the next stage. Now heavy demonic activities are being unleashed on earth. And it is going to be direct attack on people who have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this is the beauty of the 144,000 people that were seen as a symbol of the church that were being sealed because the book of Romans chapter 8 tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God, nor angels, nor demons, nor life, nor death, nor heights, nor depths, nor sickness, nor death. The only person who can separate yourself from God's love is you yourself. And you need to be careful that you don't separate yourself from the love of God because there is no demon if you are sealed under that covering of, of God you are under his covering there is no demon who can come and inflict anything upon you but the moment you walk away from God's covering the moment you disobey him you are exposing yourself you are you're coming out of that covering and you are endangering yourself to demonic attacks so pray for your children pray for yourselves pray for your dear ones we are living in a world that is going to get darker and darker moment by moment. But praise God, His seal of ownership is upon you and me. These demonic realms have no power over us. But you and I need to be careful that we don't expose ourselves to those demonic realms. Let us read the last verse together. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair 
call out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of, of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So there are three more trumpets to be blown and uh, the, this eagle that is hovering in the air, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes that no one will have an excuse to say, I did not know. In the nature, God speaks through nature. In the word of God, God speaks through the word of God. God uses people to speak the word of God. God uses spectacular events in the cosmic realm to speak to us. Nobody has an excuse to say, I did not know. I did not understand. You know, how can, let me tell you this church, we need to learn to draw the line somewhere. How can you go and celebrate and make merry in a party of Halloween? You know what Halloween means? How can you go and rejoice and have a party and merriment, rejoicing about witches and wizards and, and witchcraft? You are exposing yourself. You are exposing yourself to curse from the demonic realm. You are taking yourself from under the covering of God and exposing yourself by participating with occult, occultic practices. Please don't go and get your hands read by any palmist. That is occult. Don't go to the witch doctor or to the crystal reader. Don't go looking for your future. Don't go to the horoscopes because all these are part of the occultic world. And if you indulge in these, you are exposing yourself and your dear ones to attack from demonic realms. You know, God has put enough information in the Bible about the future and that is, you should be satisfied with that. What he needs to tell you, he will tell you through the word. That's it. Don't go looking for anything else. So be a good student of the word of God. Set your life right before God. In conclusion, I want to offer you some applications in closing. Number one, I want you to be assured of the fact that you and I as the church as believers in Christ Jesus, as disciples of Christ, we are sealed and we are under God's spiritual protection. So demonic plagues will not touch us. Even the other calamities, just like Israel was protected in Egypt, when the calamities were happening, they were there physically, but they were protected. There was special grace covering them. You and I will experience that grace and covering. So live with confidence. Do not worry because the moment you worry, what you, what the statement you are making is that you don't trust God. If you trust God, you will not worry. Secondly, believers, that is you and I, we need to stay under God's covering. Let us, be, let us take instructions from the word. Let us not go fooling around with our lives. Okay? Let us be very careful how we conduct our lives. Thirdly, I want to say to anybody here who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is a very urgent message. Time is running out. Do not resist God. Do not harden your hearts against God. Submit your lives to Christ. Come into a saving relationship with Christ because it's only Christ who can save you. Nobody else can save you. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say you may be saved or you might be saved. You will be saved when you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Let us stand up together. Is there anybody who has not received Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has ministered to you today? May I please ask you to raise your hand as your sign of agreement where you are. You want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I would, it would be my pleasure to meet with you after the service and to pray with you. Please, if you are here, do not leave this place and the Holy Spirit has ministered to you. Do not leave this place without having set your life right with God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you.